Howdy, it's Kyle talking about Dakar. It's the capital and largest city of the West African nation of Senegal and the westernmost city on the African continent. I recently had a chance to spend three weeks between the countries of Senegal and the Gambia, of which four days were spent in Dakar. And here I want to talk about the city and what it was like because we often don't hear much about African cities, just normal stuff and what they're like. I'm going to cover Dakar the same way I would cover a North American city. So I'm going to talk about the neighborhood layout, the walkability, public transit, economy, crime and security. And even though this isn't a travel video, I will have some tips for visitors. So if you're interested in learning more about a major African city, keep watching. The city of Dakar has about 1.2 million people and there are about 4 million people in the entire metro area and that's of the 19 million people in the entire country of Senegal so about one-fifth of the entire population of the country is in the metro Dakar area. The city sits on the Cape Verde Peninsula and the city limits are essentially that triangular spot, that kind of tooth area that's sticking off at the end and the suburbs are more of the arm as it goes inland. If you were to fly into the airport, it's listed as Dakar, but it's actually about 50 kilometers or 30 miles to the east of the city. I wouldn't say it's completely built up development between Dakar and the airport, but it's mostly built up and they are building a brand new administrative capital near the airport called Diomniadio. I'm sure that's not how it's pronounced, but it's a brand new administrative capital being built. In Senegal, including Dakar, the predominant religion is Islam and about 95% of the population in Dakar is Muslim. There's a decently sized Lebanese population there, about 2-3% to of the city. Also smaller numbers of Moroccans, Mauritanians, French, and Chinese. And all of the minority groups combined are about 5% of the population of Dakar. The predominant language spoken in the city is Wolof, and most of the people there are Wolof, but there are minority populations of Jola, Fulani, and Serer. Just about everybody in Dakar also speaks French. It's the main international language taught in the schools, and it's also the language used by the government for foreign affairs. I'm not going to get too much into the history, but as you might expect, this was an important center for the slave trade for the French and became a French colony, but then eventually Senegal gained independence in 1960. Senegal has been a stable democracy since then, and it's the only country in the region that's never had a military coup. Despite the tropical latitudes, most of Senegal, including where Dakar is, is not lush tropical rainforest. There's a distinct wet and dry season. The winters are very dry. You won't get any rain at all, but you will get a decent amount of rain during the summers. But even the wet season isn't that wet, as total annual precipitation is about 600 millimeters, which is 24 inches. And all of that comes between the months of June and October. When I was there in February, the temperatures were in the low 80s Fahrenheit, and it was pretty pleasant for the most part. But of course in the summer, which is the wet season, it's much hotter with much more humidity. Something else about the physical geography is the air quality, which is pretty bad. But most of the poor air quality isn't because of industrial pollution. Of course there is going to be some, it's a big city, but a lot of it is dust being blown from the Sahara. This might look like the most uninteresting photo ever, but what this is, is me taking a picture out of the airplane window as we're descending into Dakar. This is just a giant cloud of Saharan dust we're descending into. In terms of terrain, the city is mostly flat. There are some hills and some ridges along the beaches, but for the most part, the interior parts of the city are relatively flat. So those are some of the basics about the city. Now I want to talk about some of the individual neighborhoods. The downtown or central business district is the southeastern end of the peninsula. It's referred to as the plateau. This is where you have most of the major government offices, most of the major financial institutions and the high rises, plus the largest hospital in the city. For the most part, this is a fairly wealthy part of the city, but it's also home to the large Sendaga market, which is the largest outdoor traditional market in the city. So here's some footage of me walking through the market. It's a large area with a lot of paths going in different directions. Some go down some alleys, some spill out into the streets, some are just taking up the entire street itself. And you can get just about anything in this market. It's like a giant Walmart out in the streets. Household goods, food, electronics, clothes, all kinds of stuff. You do get a handful of tourists in Dakar, but not that many of them go to this market. As you can walk around here, it's mainly just locals buying their normal stuff. But there's a lot of construction going on around here. You'll see cranes and new buildings going up just outside of the market, and you'll see construction walls going up right up to the market because they're building something right next door. I think the long-term plan is to have a more permanent building for the market and then have apartments and other things built where the market is right now. With the car being so modern and cosmopolitan, it doesn't really rely on a traditional market like many other cities in the region do. 
And this was a great experience to walk around the market. When I go to a foreign city, that's just about the first place I go to is the public market. But for a city like Dakar, this is a relic of the past as most of the city is just as modern as most developed world cities. I stayed in the plateau area when I was there toward the south end of the city. And as you can see on this map, there's a road that goes up east end of the coast. Those are called the Corniche, the west one and the east one. So going north up the west Corniche from Plateau is a neighborhood called Medina. And this is arguably the most traditional part of the city and the market over there isn't as big as Sendaga, but it feels more traditional and old school. And this is a really great area to walk around because most of the tourists that go to the city go to the northwestern and southeastern corners of the city and you don't have many people here. It just feels very real, just very locals only. Going north up the west Corniche from there, the next neighborhood is Fan. This is a mostly middle class neighborhood and is also a very locals only spot with no real tourist attraction or major sites in this part of the city. So being right next to Medina, it's almost like the wealthier part of the more locals only traditional part of the city. Just inland from the West Corniche in this part of the city is an area called Point E. And this is a great part of town for walking around some really cool restaurants and shops. Again, very local feel here. And I would say after my four days in Dakar that Point E might be my favorite part of the city. Continuing north up the West Corniche, the next neighborhood is Mermoz. This is a predominantly residential area and most of it's middle class and some upper middle class as well. I didn't find myself spending too much time in this part of the city, but it is a good enough area to walk around. One neighborhood north up the West Corniche is Wacom or Ukum. I'm not sure how to pronounce this one. This is the hilliest part of the city with some terrain there. This is where you have the giant African Renaissance monument. You have some nice beaches there. The large mosque of divinity is right there on the beach. And I did go to visit the monument, although I didn't go up inside of it. The monument itself was a little controversial because it was very expensive to make and you have to pay to go into it and the money goes to the artist itself, not back into the community. But I will say as huge as it is, it really isn't as prominent as you might think. You can't see it from every part of the city like I thought you'd be able to. But one thing nice from the top of the stairs there is you get some good views of the city. So you can see most of this part of the city is dense residential and this is middle class for Dakar, although this would be relatively low income for the developed world. And now continuing up to the northwest corner of the city, this is called Engor or the Amadis. And this is the wealthiest part of the city. Many of the expatriates live there. You have a lot of the foreign embassies and most expensive hotels and restaurants. And this part of the city is pretty similar standard of living to middle class in the developed world. But you can see in these neighborhoods just how dusty it is. Even in these nicer parts of town, you just have sand building up in the gutters. Engor has a nice beach and there's also a ferry that goes to a small island called Engor Island where there's another nice beach over there. Okay, now heading east in the northernmost part of the city is this large area called Yaf. And this is a more conservative Muslim neighborhood. In fact, there's no alcohol available in this district. So it's much more quiet and laid back and probably not somewhere that most tourists are going to go to, but it is an interesting part of the city to visit. But most of the land area in this part of town is the old airport. So like I mentioned before, they built a brand new airport about 50 kilometers east of here. So this land is being completely unused. So as you can imagine, one of the main things being discussed is what to do with this giant chunk of land that's not being used. All right, now going to the eastern part of the city, just north of the plateau is the industrial zone. And it's exactly how it sounds. This is where you have the port and ferry terminals, a lot of warehouses for things coming off the ships. But this is also where you have a lot of the food and fish processing and packaging areas. So not a huge population in this part of the city with most of it being industrial and you probably won't be visiting this area except for maybe going to the ferry terminal. So you may have gathered from what I've said that essentially the entire southern half of the city is pretty nice. Essentially the entire western half of the city is pretty nice. So what does that mean? Well, the northeastern part of the city is pretty rough. When you get just east of Yoff and the defunct airport area, you get to a neighborhood called Grand Yoff. And this is where you start to see some of the poverty you might expect to see in some large developing world cities. And this part of town has incredibly high population density. It's denser than Manhattan, but you don't have any high rises here. So it's just a lot of people living in close quarters in four or lower story buildings. And this area is poor, even for a poor city with a high crime and a lot of informal housing. But there's still a city road network there. There's still power grid and sewer. There's a new wastewater treatment plant going up near there. 
So it doesn't have the same shanty town feel like some of these informal areas on the outskirts of many major cities in developing countries, but this is still a very poor area and one of the highest crime part of the cities as well. So as a result, this neighborhood and the ones just to the northeast of here, ones you're probably not going to be visiting, and this is just about the only part of town that I didn't walk around. But when I was stuck in traffic in the back of a taxi on a freeway in this part of town, I could see just how poor some of the housing was. Many of these were just cinder block shells with no windows or doors. So obviously you never want to see poverty like this, but at the same time, this was a relatively small part of the city. So you think of just how large the car is and a small part of the aerial footprint was like this. To give you an idea of the amount of violent crime, there were about 1,100 murders in the country of Senegal in 2022, and the country has about 20 million people. To put that in perspective, there were 1,200 murders in the U.S. state of Georgia, which has about 10 million people, and there were almost 1,500 murders in Florida, which has about 22 million. The country doesn't keep stats by murders per city, but I do have to imagine that most of those are going to be in Dakar, but overall the city isn't any more violent than most American cities. And during my entire time there, I didn't feel unsafe at all. Now, I wasn't walking around by myself late at night, but I felt very safe walking around the streets. A place that I want to mention that isn't part of the car, but is very close, is called Gori Island. The island is accessible by a short ferry ride you take from the port area. And when you get to the island, it's very small, no roads, just walking paths, and a great way to spend half a day walking around. The history of the island is awful. This was the main shipping off point for slaves in the French West Africa territories. There's a museum there called the House of Slaves and a spot called the Gate of No Return, which is where many people saw their family for the last time before they were shipped off. And you can certainly see the French colonial influence in the architecture there. A lot of it looks like the French Quarter in New Orleans. And sadly, that makes sense because the French were shipping a lot of slaves out of Senegal and many of them ended up in New Orleans. There are about a thousand or so people that live on the island, and there's a little bit of an artist community there. So if you are going to visit, I do highly recommend taking the ferry over to Goree Island. It's a wonderful experience. So I'm going to use talking about the ferry as a transition to talk about how to get around the city, walking and transit. I found the city to be great for walking with a nice pattern of streets, and with it being relatively flat, it was just really easy to traverse the city on foot. It is a big city, so you can't walk the entire city in one day, but I was able to spend each of my four days walking around a different part of the city, and I was able to cover a lot of it. Each of the days I was there, I walked about 15, 20 kilometers, at least 10 miles or so. I can imagine during the summer wet season with it being so hot and humid and rainy, you wouldn't want to walk around that much, but during the dry season, it's pretty good. In terms of public transit, you have several options in terms of quality, comfort, and price. At the lowest end of the spectrum are what are called the sept places, or seven-seater in French, and yes, that's what that means. These things will fit seven people, and that doesn't include the driver, so there's actually eight people in these things. But these things are super cheap, they're easy to cast, and you'll see people taking them all over town, but they do not look anything like comfortable. One step up are these buses that are ubiquitous around a car, and these things are always brightly painted and super crowded. If they can fit three more people in there, they'll fit eight more in there. There'll be guys hanging off the back, sometimes with the door open, they're swinging around. I saw dudes laying on their bellies on the roofs of these things, the ones that have the luggage racks on the side. And I'll be legit, the first thing I thought of when I saw these things is the old bus in the Muppet movies. So I do not have the fortunate opportunity to ride in one of these, but they are cheap. The next level up are the Tata buses made by the Indian manufacturer Tata. And these are more like your typical city buses, but they aren't anywhere near as comfortable. They have vinyl seats, there are no windows, they have bars on them, and no air conditioning. But there are fewer of these, they're a little more expensive, and they follow very specific routes. The other type buses and cars just kind of go wherever. However, the cream of the crop for public transit in Dakar are these brand new buses. They just rolled these things out, I think in November 23 and the beginning of 24, so they were brand new starting when I was there. There were only a few in operation when I was there, but I think the overall plan for the next couple of years is to gradually transition to just having these buses. They were 100% electric, so no fumes, less noise, and I get some of the more dangerous buses off the road. And this is huge for Dakar because I think public transit is the one part of the city where it's developing world nature really shows. I think moving forward with these modern buses is a huge step in the right direction. The most expensive way to get around town is by taxi, although if you are a foreign visitor, it's still pretty cheap to take a taxi. 
And you gotta love a Dakar taxi. They're held together by duct tape and chicken wire. They're hanging by a thread. They're all over town. They're easy to cast. If you don't want to ride one of the buses, it's probably your best option. For roads, they've recently built a freeway that gets you out of the city to the airport. It's a large four or six lane auto route. Before then, it was only surface side streets to get out of the car. So go back to this map. You can imagine the entire city being funneled onto the surface streets getting out. It was a nightmare. So having this freeway allows all of the traffic and truck traffic to get in and out of the city much more easily. However, instead of building an eight or 10 lane freeway, they built a four and six lane freeway as well as a brand new rail line. So now you have something called the Train Express Regional. This is a high speed train that connects the city to the suburbs and out to the airport. It's not true high speed rail. It only goes 160 miles an hour, but there's a limited number of stops. So it's more of a commuter train that does more an express route as opposed to stopping in every little spot. There are only 14 stations over about 54 kilometers of track. And right now they're working on extending it to farther areas. So I would have to say the city and national governments have done a really good job of improving transit. So you get these brand new buses, you have this brand new auto route, the new train line, the new airport. And again, Senegal is a poor country, but I think it's very wise to invest into infrastructure like this. It really helps out the city and the surrounding areas. And that leads me to the next thing I want to discuss. What is Dakar's future? The idea with this brand new administrative capital being built 50 kilometers east of the city is to make it so that Dakar doesn't have everything in the country. So right now it's the governmental, economic, financial, cultural, and industrial capital of the country. So at least moving the government stuff somewhere else eases the, the need for Dakar to be everything. But when I think about the future of Dakar, the first thing I think about is that giant space of airport that's not being used. Again, look at how much of the city's land is just this empty airport. There's so much they can do with this. And what they do with that land is likely to be a huge driver of where the city goes in the future. Completely different ends of the spectrum here. You could just build all luxury, fancy housing and invite a bunch of expatriates to move there. You can build a lot of brand new lower income housing, get people out of those shanty town and informal housing type areas. You can have part of it be an industrial park, invite international companies to open up factories there. It can be turned into a large green space with the city being so hot and dusty, this would help. Or perhaps what is most likely a combination of all of those things. So we'll all have to see what happens. I think they've done some good things with transit. Now we'll have to see what they can do with new cities and new development. Now I want to mention a few tips for people that might be visiting Dakar. There's a non-stop flight from most of the major European airports. Delta and Air Senegal have a non-stop flight from New York JFK. However, as great as this airport is that just opened up in 2017, they've already outgrown it. So with that being said, when you're flying out of Dakar, you'll probably want to get to the airport earlier than you were thinking. Something else is you will have to speak French unless by chance you happen to speak Wolof. I'm going to assume you don't, so you will have to be able to speak French. If you want to visit the westernmost point in Africa, and you probably will, it's a nice spot. It's kind of difficult to get to. There's a big housing construction project going on there, a new hotel. So you have to kind of walk through the construction areas to get to the westernmost points, but it's worth it. But it's a really cool spot because you're going out on these rocks that are underwater during high tide, and you're standing there on a the tide that's coming in from both sides. So I do recommend visiting Dakar and Senegal in general. And if you're going to be using the Dakar airport as a layover spot, consider making it an extended layover with a day or two there. So I hope you were able to learn something about Dakar. I think many people outside of Africa view most of the major cities there as just being one giant developing world dumpster fire. So yeah, Dakar and Senegal, a great place to visit and not as far as you think. And if you're from Dakar or Senegal in general, please let me know in the comments how well this 2Bob did in describing the city. So that was my overview of Dakar. I enjoyed my time there and I might very well end up back there again someday, if even only for a layover. But if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography from a nerd. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special thanks to my superior patrons for their support, especially Grant F. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. As always, thank you very much.